Good morning and welcome to this Legal Aid New South Wales Law Webinar, Legal Words for Interpreters, Civil Law Words. My name is Kerry Wright and I work in the Community Legal Education Branch at Legal Aid New South Wales. I'm here today with Bridget Barker, a civil lawyer and also a member of the CLE team with Legal Aid New South Wales. We'll be joined later also by Yolanda Diaquino from the Immigration Law Team at Legal Aid New South Wales. Hi Bridget. Good morning Kerry, good morning everybody. I'm so happy to see so many people joining us this morning. I'm a civil solicitor and I work in the Lismore Office of Legal Aid, so I'm joining you from the far north of the state. And as Kerry said, um, I am at the moment able to work with the CLE branch and therefore present this webinar today. Mm, thank you. So to begin, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. We'd also like to pay respect to the elders of this land, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today or watching the recording after today. And thanks everyone for answering the questions in your registration. We now know that you've had experience interpreting in a range of civil law matters in courts and tribunals, including the NCAT, the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, the Family Court, the Local Court, the District Court and the Supreme Court. And also people have mentioned other um, tribunals um, that they work in from across Australia. So what we're going to do is just do uh, a quick poll with you all, which is about your experience interpreting. So I'll just launch that uh, poll now. So you, it's coming up and you can use your device. How much experience do you have interpreting in civil law cases? Quite a lot, a little bit, none yet, but I'm interested. So I'll just let people vote, Bridget, and then I'll share the um, the results with you. Uh, just see, we've got I think about just over 100 people with us today, which is fantastic. And all right, I think most people have voted, so I'll close that, share the results with you. So you'll see there, um, Bridget, that 47% have said a little bit, 26% quite a lot and 26% none yet, but I'm interested. So there's there's quite a diverse range of experiences with our there um, is. audience today. Yeah, Kerry, there is. And um, I'm glad that we have people with a little bit and none yet, but they're interested because the webinar will be of particular interest to them and people who already have experience uh, may come across some words that we've chosen to define um, that they haven't struck or that they weren't sure of. So hopefully there's something for everybody today. Definitely. All right, so I'll hide that and bring up our presentation again. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to look at the Australian court system, legal words and concepts, what is civil law, where civil law matters are heard, people in courts and tribunals, words used in courts and tribunals, civil law document words, immigration law words, financial hardship words around debts and fines, family and domestic violence orders, and we'll of course be answering your questions. So Bridget, you're going to take us through this slide, which is about the courts. Yes, yeah, so we thought it would be good to begin with just a general explanation about the court system in Australia. If you look at the slide, the uh, courts that sit towards the bottom are the lower level courts and we have both a state system and a federal system in Australia of courts. So the state courts are the local court, the district court and the Supreme Court. And if you look at the arrows on the slide, they show the direction that a, an appeal to a higher court would follow generally. Um, we also have state tribunals and that's off to the left with arrows to both the District Court and Supreme Court. So you can see that an appeal from each of those courts, uh, from a tribunal would go to those courts. 
And then in the federal system, we have the Federal Circuit Court, the Federal Court of Australia, and there are federal tribunals as well, and appeals from federal tribunals go to the federal court. And then matters heard in the Supreme Court and the federal court can, in certain instances, be taken on appeal to the High Court of Australia, which is the highest court in our court hierarchy in Australia. So just to explain that a tribunal is different to a court. Uh, a tribunal is a body that resolves disputes between parties. There are different tribunals that specialise in different sorts of matters. Orders made by a tribunal are legally enforceable. An example of a tribunal that you may have come across is the Fair Work Commission. The Fair Work Commission decides issues to do with our national workplace relations well, basically employment law. And we'll be talking about the names of some specific tribunals a bit further on in this session that are particular tribunals where civil law matters are heard. Thanks, Kerry. Okay. So now we're going to move into some of those legal words and concepts. Thanks, Bridget. Now, these aren't particular words and concepts that only exist in civil law, but they're legal words and concepts that you will probably come across if you're interpreting uh, in one of our offices, or um, you may well come across them in courts and tribunals as well. So the first word is instructions. Before a solicitor can take any action or make any decisions, they have to have what's called instructions from their client. So this is when a client tells a solicitor what their legal problem is and what they want. When a solicitor gives legal advice, they will probably be suggesting that the person take a particular action, but it is up to the client to decide if they want to take that action or not. And they tell or instruct the solicitor whether or not they want to go ahead. Following on from that is confidentiality. This is where um, solicitors are bound by professional rules. That mean that anything told to them by a client must be kept confidential. So if you tell a solicitor about your legal problem, the solicitor cannot talk to anyone else about it unless they have your permission. They can't tell courts what their clients tell them without their client's permission, um, except in certain rare circumstances. Privilege is another legal concept. Legal professional privilege is what protects confidential communication and confidential documents between a lawyer or solicitor and their client. As long as those communications and documents are created for the dominant purpose of the solicitor providing legal advice to the client or providing professional legal services to the client, or if they're created or, or communicated when the solicitor is anticipating that there will be legal uh, litigation or, um, or whether the matter will go to court. So that is a uh, protection provided along with confidentiality to clients who come and see a lawyer. Precedent is the next word. Precedent describes how the system of law works in Australia. So decisions made by the higher courts, the Supreme Court, Federal Court and the High Court of Australia are binding on lower courts. This means that decisions made in those courts about particular legal concepts have to be followed by a court that is lower in the court hierarchy. Decisions can also be binding on a tribunal. A decision made by an appeal court or tribunal will bind a lower court or tribunal. This ensures that like cases 
cases about the same sorts of legal issues are decided in a similar way and it makes our legal system a bit more reliable and it means that people can know and understand what the law says about a particular type of matter. Statutory limitation. This is a deadline for starting legal action. Different types of legal action have different time limits. An example is if you are unfairly dismissed from your work, you only have three weeks in which to bring a claim for unfair dismissal. Race discrimination is another example and there is a one year time limit or personal injury from an accident is a three year time limit. So statutory limitation or time limit is a time set in which you have to start legal action. If you go beyond that time, you might have lost your right to bring a legal action. Conflict of interest. This is where a lawyer may have previously given advice to a person in the same or a related matter or where you and your lawyer have interests that clash. An example is a lawyer who previously advised a husband about his divorce cannot act for the wife in the same family law matter or a lawyer cannot act for both an accused person and a victim in a criminal matter. There are three main areas where lawyers can have a conflict of interest. That is where the client's interests conflict with the lawyer's own interests or where the law interests of one of the lawyer's clients conflicts with the interests of another of the lawyer's clients, or where the interests of a current client conflict with the interests of a former client. This rule usually applies to all lawyers from one legal firm or organisation. And the purpose of the rule is to ensure that a lawyer is always acting in their client's best interests and doing their very best for the client. And it would be hard to do that if you were working for both people on different sides of a legal dispute. Hmm. Okay, thanks Bridget. Well, we'll bring up the next um, slide with some more legal words and concepts, thanks. Thank you, Kerry. So burden of proof, this is a legal standard that a party has to meet to prove their case. In civil cases, the burden of proof is the balance of probabilities, which is our next word or term. Balance of probabilities means more likely than not. So if you bring a civil case, you need to satisfy the court or tri tribunal that what you're saying in your case is more likely than not to be correct. To win a case, a person making a claim has to bring enough evidence to prove on the balance of probabilities that it is more likely than not that their claim is true. The next word we have is common law. So we have laws in Australia made in two different sorts of ways. Common law is judge made law. So when a court decides a matter that their decisions make law, and as I said before, in relation to precedent, decisions of judges in higher courts in the court hierarchy are binding on decisions of lower courts in the court hierarchy. The other sort of law that we have in Australia is statute law or legislation, and their laws made by our parliament, both our federal parliament and our state parliament. Sometimes what happens is a judge in a court makes a decision interpreting legislation or statute law and their interpretation then becomes a common law precedent that other courts have to follow. If the parliament does not like a particular decision of the court, it can vote and decide to change the statute law. So another word for laws made by parliament is acts of parliament. Mm -hmm. Duty of care is a civil law concept 
and it's the duty of a person or organisation to look after another person or in common terms, I guess, care for them. An example of this is an employer has an, a duty of care to make sure that all health and safety rules are followed to keep their employees safe or a doctor making sure they give the best treatment possible to their patients. They have a duty of care to do that, to provide a high standard of care to their patients. Uh, another example is a shopping centre. They have a duty of care to make sure that their premises or the shopping centre is safe so people don't injure themselves when they're in the shopping centre. Procedural fairness. This is a legal principle that says people must be made aware of claims or charges against them and have a chance to defend the claim or charge. Negligence is another legal concept and that's where a person has a legal duty of care but they breach that duty of care or they don't follow that duty of care and this causes the other person to experience loss or damage. And so that concept is that where they breach their duty of care, there has been negligence. Compensation or damages is mon money claimed or awarded by a court or a tribunal to compensate a party for loss or injury and it's designed to put them back in the position they were in before a legal wrong happened. An example is a car accident case. Damages might be awarded to that include the cost of repairs to a car, hiring a replacement car or replacing items that were in the car and damaged at the time of the accident. If you had a recovery of goods case, damages may or compensation may include income lost by a person as a result of not being able to use those goods. And the last word in this section is terms of settlement. Terms of settlement is a document that records how two or more parties have agreed to settle or resolve a civil law case. I think that's everything for that slide, Kerry. Yes, thanks Bridget, that's that's fantastic. Um, I do want to just remind people for the webinar that it is, we're just providing legal information today, not legal advice. So if any of the questions that come through are about a particular legal matter or a legal question, um, we'll just have to follow that up because it's not something that Bridget can sort of answer on the spot. So we'll just um, go forward and um, tell us, Bridget, what is civil law then? Okay, so yes, we thought we'd better explain what is civil law. Most people understand criminal law because it usually involves the police and most people also understand family law easily because it involves disputes between parents, um, issues about uh, who's going to have the care of the children. But civil law is very broad and so one way of describing civil law is that they tend to be everyday problems that have a legal side to them. At Legal Aid we call civil law, law for everyday life. Civil law, as I said, is very broad and it can cover, include issue, legal issues about finances, about accidents, about property, about employment. It can also involve disputes with a government department. At Legal Aid, we don't cover every area of civil law and we focus on those areas which have an impact on economically and socially isolated and vulnerable people. Other examples of what um, our civil law areas include government law and that includes um, immigration law which Yolanda will be talking about a bit later in today's webinar. Also um, social security law which might be a dispute that you might have with Centrelink for example or Department of Human Services. 
discrimination and employment law are other areas of uh, in, that come under the term civil law. So unlawful discrimination is unfair treatment that is against the law. Consumer law can include credit, debt and mortgage matters. There's also mental health law and guardianship law and they're laws that protect adults with cognitive or mental disabilities or people who have mental illness or intellectual disabilities and who can't make life decisions on their own. At Legal Aid, we also have a specialist unit called the Coronial, Coronial Inquests Unit. And uh, that unit um, deals with matters that are in, being investigated by the state coroner. Finally, we also have a work and development order service that is a program for disadvantaged people to that helps them pay their fines by undertaking unpaid work or participating in a course or treatment program. So that is hopefully gives you a better idea about what civil law is. Mm -hmm. And Bridget, we've got one person's asked, could you please explain burden of proof again in civil law? Okay, so if you bring a civil law case, you have to satisfy the court of your case. So you have to satisfy the court that what you're saying happened or what you're saying your perspective on the case is is the one that the court should find in favour of or make a decision in favour of. And so the balance of probabilities is the civil law standard of proof. So for instance, if you had a motor vehicle accident and you wanted to bring a claim against the person who was at fault for the accident, for damage to your car, then and it wasn't covered by insurance, you may bring a claim in the local court to try and recover the money that's owed to you. You have to bring, provide the court with evidence and that might be documents or photos and statements of witnesses and satisfy the court that it's more likely than not that you were the person who was not at fault and therefore the damage to your car should be paid for by the person who was responsible for the accident. I hope that clarifies that for you a bit better. That's great, thank you. So we're now just going to do, launch a poll just to find out um, some information from you all about your, your most recent interpreting experiences. So that person said, yes, thank you, Bridget, that was helpful. So I'll just launch oh, this good. poll so you can all see it. Has your most recent interpreting for civil law been on the telephone? by video, in person, or you haven't uh, done any interpreting for civil law yet? Someone's asked a question about whether the webinar is being recorded. Yes, it is, and it will go up on the Legal Aid New South Wales YouTube channel. I'll probably have that up before the end of the week, which you can find through the Legal Aid New South Wales website homepage and click on the the icon for YouTube and you'll find it in the community legal education playlist. So people are voting and uh, I think I'll, most people have voted by now. So I'll close that and share the results with you, Bridget. So we've got 31% who haven't done any interpreting, but 30% have been on the telephone, 24% in person, and 15% by, um, by video. So it looks like we've got a, a broad range of experience, uh, Bridget. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I actually thought that perhaps, um, tele, well, I guess telephone and video are together are the majority um, the main way that interpreting is happening at the moment. I, I imagine that with COVID restrictions that it's difficult for people to provide interpreting services in person. So some challenges there, I imagine, interpreting on the telephone and by video. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, definitely. So we're now going to move on to where civil law happens. Do you want to take us through this slide, Bridget? 
Yes, so for those of you who've joined us from other states in Australia, um, you may have names for tribunals that are different to those in New South Wales. But in New South Wales, we have a tribunal called the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And that tribunal deals with quite a broad range of matters, including disputes about residential tenancy, uh, building works, guardianship, and administrative review of government decisions. So that is where um, if you are unhappy with a decision made by government, in some circumstances, you have a right to seek review of that decision by a tribunal. So that's the New South Wales State Tribunal. There's also a, a tribunal called the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, and that's a tribunal that falls in the federal system. So you remember, um, hopefully you'll remember from the slide that we had earlier that we had the federal system of courts and tribunals and the state system of courts and tribunals. So NCAT is in the state system and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is in the federal system. And this is a tribunal that reviews decisions made by government departments. Some examples of the sorts of decisions it reviews are decisions about family assistance, paid parental leave, social security matters or Centrelink decisions, decisions about student assistance, and then of course, migration and refugee visa related matters also taxation and um, entitlements of veterans. The next one in our list is the Fair Work Commission and also the Fair Work Ombudsman. Now they're two separate organisations but dealing with issues to do with employment law. So the Fair Work Commission is a tribunal that helps people resolve disputes about employment under the Fair Work Act. The Fair Work Act is an act of parliament that has been made by the federal parliament. And that means that that law applies right across Australia. The Fair Work Ombudsman is a government body that looks into complaints when people don't get their correct pay at work, including holiday pay, leave loading and superannuation. And they also investigate um, bigger issues that may affect larger numbers of people to do with employment law. So the term ombudsman um, uh, occurred in the Fair Work Ombudsman, but it's, it's used um, more broadly in both state and federal systems. And an ombudsman is a person and office who receives complaints about decisions of public and private entities and tries to resolve them. An example is the New South Wales Ombudsman. Uh, the New South Wales Ombudsman receives complaints about police and other New South Wales government departments. There are many types of different ombudsmen. Uh, another example is that there is a financial ombudsman service the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Uh, there is a credit, no, there's not any more, sorry. Um, and the uh, AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority is an ombudsman service that deals with complaints about financial services, including insurance issues. And there's also an ombudsman that deals with complaints about the telecommunication industry. So complaints about mobile phone providers um, as an example or internet service providers. The next in our list is Revenue New South Wales. Revenue New South Wales is a government agency that administers the New South Wales fine system. So they're responsible for receiving and collecting outstanding fines and penalties that um, people have been given. An example is if you receive a fine for parking in the wrong place or for speeding, if you don't pay that fine within a certain time period, 
then it will go to Revenue New South Wales and they will try and get you to pay the fine. Finally, a financial counsellor. This is a term that comes up frequently in civil law matters. So they're a person who gives free, confidential and independent help to people who have financial problems. So problems to do with their personal finances, with their income and if they have too many debts and things are getting out of control for them. We would usually refer people with those sorts of problems to a financial counsellor who can help them try and uh, negotiate with the people they owe money to to get more time or perhaps to have a debt waived. Okay, so Bridget, I've got a question here. Is a tribunal such as the AAT considered as something close to a lower court? Uh, I guess um, I'm just trying to think exactly where the AAT would, would sit, but yes, they probably would be um, in line with, I guess, a local court in the way that you thought about them in the court and tribunal hierarchy and then appeals from decisions of the AAT would go to the Federal Court of Australia. Mm. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we'll now move on and we'll get you to take us through this slide which is coming up which is all the people that you find in a courtroom or a tribunal, who are they? Yes, that's right. So you may, if you've attended our webinar about criminal law, you may have heard some of these terms previously, um, but we thought we would um, go through them because there are some terms that are used particularly in civil law matters. So I'll start with the person who has the highest uh, seat in the courtroom and they are the magistrate, judge, member or registrar. And the, these are the people who make the decisions in a court or tribunal. A magistrate is the title given to the person in the local court or the uh, federal circuit court who makes decisions. A judge is the name given to the decision maker who is in the district court, supreme court, uh, although, sorry, no, um, in the district court, um, when you get to the Supreme and High Court, the term used is justice. Although it means that these terms all mean the same thing, they are the person who makes decisions in that particular court. And then member is generally the, the title given to a person who makes decisions in tribunals. And registrar is the title given to someone who works in a court office, but who also sometimes makes decisions in the court, usually about less complex issues. Sometimes a registrar might make decisions about um, standing matters over to a later date where people aren't ready to have their matter heard that day. That's just an example of a decision that a registrar would make. Then I'll move to uh, the uh, box over to the right that has a chair in it but nobody's sitting there. That's um, where a witness would sit. A witness is a person who is called by one of the parties in a civil law case to give evidence on their behalf. So if you had, again I'll use the car accident example, if you had a, a case about a car accident and there was someone in your car with you at the time that you had the car accident and they can tell the court what they saw happen, you might call them as a witness so they can tell the court what they saw and heard happen in when the accident occurred. Now the person standing at the microphone, uh, we've put the label there defendant, now that is more often a term used in criminal law matters, but um, it is sometimes comes up in civil law matters. Um, so the defendant is the person who has a charge 
brought against them. And the reason we've included it in the civil law words is that sometimes a council might um, be prosecuting or bringing a claim against a person. And in that case, a representative of the council is the person who prosecutes the claim or who brings the claim on behalf of the council in, in a court. And the person against whom the claim or case is being brought is called the defendant. So the people sitting at the uh, desk where there's three of them in a row and where we also have the word prosecutor, I'll go through these terms now. So starting from closest to the front is a solicitor and then there's the word lawyer. Now those terms are really interchangeable. A solicitor or a lawyer is somebody who has a law degree or a legal qualification and who is an, entitled to act on behalf of clients in a court or a tribunal. And um, a barrister is similarly someone who has a law degree but who specialises in what is called advocacy and that is means that they specialise um, in speaking on people's behalf in courts and tribunals. And sometimes if you go to a solicitor or a lawyer to get legal advice and you tell them that you want to bring a case with their advice, then the solicitor may instruct or engage a barrister to also act on your behalf because they have the special skill of speaking in the court on behalf on your behalf. Now I'm uh, going to start with the terms at the back of the courtroom now. So complainant in many civil law cases is a person who brings a legal case on their own behalf in a tribunal or a court. Um, and that word is often interchangeable depending on the sort of matter that it is with the other words applicant and plaintiff. So I guess the difference between criminal law and civil law is that in criminal law, usually it is the police who are bringing a case against someone because they've been charged. In civil law matters, generally you have to bring a case on your own behalf unless you have a solicitor to represent you. So complainant, um, applicant and plaintiff are terms that are fairly interchangeable in the civil law area for people who are bringing a case against another person. The term respondent is uh, stands for the person against whom you're bringing a case. So if you um, bring a case in a tribunal relating to a consumer law issue, if you bought a fridge and it stopped working and you can't uh, resolve your complaint with the, the shop that you bought the fridge from, you might choose to bring a case against them and you would be the applicant and the shop that sold the fridge would be the respondent. Okay, great, thanks Bridget. So we've got now a slide with words about courts and tribunals to take, take us through. Yeah, so these are terms that if you're interpreting in courts and tribunals, you might hear being used. And so we thought we would go some of the through some of these to explain what they mean. So the first one is mention. Mention is a short court appearance where no major decisions are usually made. A mention allows a court or tribunal to check on how the parties are going, preparing their matter for, for a hearing. Um, a party might ask for the court to for more time to prepare. At a mention, a court or a tribunal can also decide on a hearing date or a date 
at which the member or the magistrate or judge will actually hear the evidence and make a decision about the case. It's also an opportunity for the court or tribunal to make some orders about what the parties have to do. The first time parties go to a court or tribunal um, for their case is usually a mention because it's too early for anything to else to happen. Uh, and uh, it's the way that a court or tribunal manages the cases that they have in uh, before them. The next term is call over. A call over often happens once a matter has been set down for hearing. That's me that means that once a matter has been given a date uh, when the court or tribunal will hear the evidence. So the court or tribunal will check with the parties at the call over about when it they think the matter will be ready to be heard. And that means that when they will have had enough time to uh, get their witnesses organised and um, prepare any um, evidence that they have to file, such as a st witness statement. Um, the court um, generally doesn't allow people an um, endless amount of time and they have callovers and mentions to make sure the parties are keeping to um, a timetable that's set by the court. And so a call over is part of the way, again, that um, courts and tribunals manage the cases that they have before them. Pretrial conference is another term that you may hear, and that's often used um, in civil law matters. And it, um, I guess, can be interchangeable with call over and mention. It's often the first time in a civil matter that a case is mentioned in court. And again, it's part of the way that courts manage cases. Status conference is another term for a short court or tribunal appearance. Um, it's often um, in civil matters in the local court um, at which uh, the matter is given a date for hearing. And again, it's part of the way that case uh, courts and tribunals manage cases. So I've used the word hearing a lot and hearing is when a court or tribunal case is heard by the decision maker, so the judge, magistrate or member. It's the time when both sides of a case uh, put their evidence um, before the decision maker. So they might have witnesses that they call to tell what they saw and heard and um, then the judge and or magistrate or tribunal member after hearing all the evidence will make a decision in the case. Ex parte is another term that comes up in civil cases and it can also um, happen in criminal cases. And this is where one of the parties doesn't um, come to court or the tribunal on the hearing date. And so um, if there is no real excuse for the person not to um, attend the hearing, and if the court and tribunal haven't heard from them to explain why they can't get there, then in some circumstances, the case will go ahead and the court or tribunal will make a decision uh, based on the evidence of the person who brought the case. It's a serious issue to do this because uh, it, it may mean that there is a, a lack of procedural fairness, which is the term I talked about earlier. But it also means that if people don't have a, a good reason for not turning up, that they don't stop the person who brought the case from having their case heard. It's not a decision, uh, a decision to hear a matter ex parte, which means in the absence of the person. It's not taken lightly by courts and tribunals, but sometimes they will go ahead and hear a matter even though one of the parties is not there. Interim hearing is a hearing that looks at, at issues in a case that need to be decided in the short term. 
They might be urgent issues um, such as making an order for a payment to be made um, and they happen, an interim hearing happens before the full hearing of the case goes ahead. So an interim order is an order made by a court or tribunal until a final order is made and it usually helps a party to maintain the current situation until the court or tribunal makes a final decision. Adjournment, so that's a term that comes up a lot. It, it just means postponing a court hearing or a court mention to a later date. It is usual to ask for an adjournment at the beginning of a case when a party might be waiting for particular evidence that they haven't yet received. An example might be if you've asked a specialist to provide a report in your matter and they haven't been able to get it to you, you could then ask the court for an adjournment or a postponement to a later date so that you can have that uh, piece of evidence when the matter is heard. Usually an adjournment is only granted or, or given by the decision maker if there are good reasons for needing to delay the matter. Stay of proceedings is another term that comes up a bit. Um, that's an order of the court that stops a court case from continuing and it might be either um, on a temporary basis or permanently. A stay order might also be made to put a court order on hold until after an appeal has heard. So sometimes um, a decision is made by a court um, that may not be the final decision, but the person um, who isn't happy with that decision decides they want to appeal to a, a high court about that issue. And when they do that, um, the other case being heard in court is stayed or stopped until their appeal has been heard. An injunction is a court order that compels a party or forces them to either stop doing something or to make them do something. An example of an, a situation where there may be an injunction is where somebody applies to usually the Supreme Court for an injunction to stop a bank or a council from selling a house until the legal issues are decided about the house. An injunction may also be um, applied for by, uh, by to a court to stop the media reporting on a particular case. Sometimes you hear about that um, where the media wants to be able to talk about what's happening in a case, but the judge or decision maker grants an injunction to stop them reporting because the case is dealing with particularly sensitive issues or because the case might involve um, a young person under 18. Now I've used the next term quite a bit already and that is evidence. So evidence is information such as documents or witnesses, a person that you ask to come and talk in court on your behalf that is used in court to prove something. So we talked about the burden of proof. If you bring a case in civil law, you need to give the court or tribunal evidence, so it might be documents or witnesses, to prove your case to the standard of proof. So you have to satisfy the court or tribunal that your case, um, what you say happened or should happen, is more likely than not. There are strict rules in civil matters about what evidence can be used and how it can be used. And this is to ensure fairness to both parties in a case. Notice of motion is another term you might hear in a court or tribunal, probably more often in a court. A notice of motion is a document that one party might 
um, file in a court or tribunal when they're asking the court or tribunal to do something. What happens when you file a notice of motion is that you um, also file a document called an affidavit and you set out in your affidavit the reasons why you're asking the court or tribunal to make a particular decision. You ha an affidavit is a document that you swear uh, that what you are saying is in that document is the truth. And then lastly, appeal, which is a term I've used already in this um, webinar. Uh, an appeal is when you apply to a higher court asking them to change the decision of a lower court or tribunal. So if you're unhappy with a final decision that's made in a case that you bring, you usually have a right to appeal to a higher court and um, ask a higher court to review the decision made by the lower court or tribunal. Okay, I think that's thanks. everything. Yes, <laughs> it's a long list. So we're just going to talk now about words and documents and then we'll uh, have a, a short break after we cover this, these words and then uh, Yolanda will join us after the break. So probably got about another five minutes and then we'll have a break. So over to okay. you, Bridget. Thanks, Kerry. So yeah, some of these terms I've referred to already, but an affidavit is a written document that can be used um, as evidence for court. In an affidavit, you include factual information about what you saw or heard or felt. And an affidavit is signed in front of someone who is called an authorised person. And you either swear on a Bible or other religious text, or you affirm before that person that what you've said in that document is true. And so it's a sworn document that it can be used in a court or tribunal as evidence. A statutory declaration is similar to an affidavit and um, you, uh, you can use it in a broader context than an affidavit. An affidavit is generally used in uh, legal cases whereas a statutory declaration can also be something that is used um, in other areas of life. An example is when you arrive in Australia on an aeroplane, there is often a statutory declaration that you're asked to fill in about where you've come from and things that you might have brought with you um, from another country. Deponent is a person who gives written evidence in an affidavit or a statutory declaration and who swears or affirms that what they've um, said or written in their stat deck or their affidavit is true. So a deponent is the person who um, prepares or, or writes an affidavit or a statutory declaration. Uh, Authorised person I referred to earlier is the person, it's a category of people who can um, take the oath or affirmation of a person who has prepared an affidavit or statutory declaration and who can witness their signature. An example of an authorised person is a justice of the peace or a solicitor or barrister and sometimes it can also be a bank manager. So they're people who can witness another person's um, oath or affirmation that their what they've said in their affidavit or statutory declaration is true. Now authority to uh, uh, oath or affirmation I sort of have talked about already but um, it's the way that you swear um, or state that what is included in your affidavit or statutory declaration is true. 
Now, authority to act. An authority to act is a legal document that allows a client to appoint another person, usually a solicitor or barrister, to act on their behalf. Sometimes if you go and see a solicitor, they may ask you to sign this document that says that um, you appoint that solicitor to act on your behalf. A solicitor might ask you to do that because sometimes they have to provide that to someone else they're dealing with on your behalf to prove that they have your authority or your permission to act on your behalf in relation to a particular matter. Authority to release is another form that a solicitor or barrister might ask a client to sign. And that is a legal document you sign that gives your consent to another um, agency, such as a hospital or a doctor or the police or Service New South Wales, to release information to your solicitor or barrister. Assigned authority to release allows your solicitor or barrister to get documents on your behalf and they would be doing that in order to um, get information or evidence to help with your legal case. Government and non-government agencies have to obey laws about privacy and they can't release information they have about you without assigned authority to release. And some government agencies have their own form that they expect you to use. An example of this would be Centrelink. If you uh, want your solicitor to be able to access your Centrelink records, Centrelink has its own authority form that you and the solicitor would have to fill in. Now, moving over to the other side, power of attorney. A power of attorney is a legal document that gives a person or trustee organisation the legal authority to manage your finances and make financial and legal decisions on your behalf. A power of attorney can be general or enduring and the difference between those is that an enduring power of attorney is something that continues to have um, legal authority once you lose the mental capacity to make decisions on your own behalf. You often see an enduring power of attorney being used for older people. Um, so if they um, lose the ability to make decisions on their own behalf, then the person they've appointed as their enduring attorney can make decisions for them. Uh, enduring um, guardian is someone you appoint to make decisions about your lifestyle and health on your behalf when you no longer have the capacity to make them for yourself. So when the word enduring is used in relation to a power of attorney or a guardian, it means that they can act for you once you can no longer make decisions for yourself. A subpoena is a court order that tells uh, another person or a company that they have to bring certain documents to a court or to a tribunal or that they have to appear at a court or tribunal to give evidence. If a person doesn't do what a subpoena tells them to, they may be arrested for not complying with a subpoena because it's a court order. A statement of claim, the last term, it's a court document that you use to start a civil case. So a statement of claim is the document you would have to fill in and file in a court or lodge with a court if you wanted to bring a case about damage to your car. That is the name of the document that you would file. I think mm. that's all of those now, Kerry. Yes, and um, Bridget, can you just clarify with the power of attorney, whether general or enduring, is that just for financial decisions? Yes, so I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. A power of attorney 
is the document that allows um, somebody to make financial decisions on your behalf. So anything to do with money and that includes uh, accessing your bank account on your behalf. And so um, you would only be allowed to do that once the power of attorney has been provided to the bank. Whereas okay. a guardian form is um, the form that deals with health and lifestyle decisions. So it's, yeah. if it's to do with money, it's the power of attorney. If it's to do with health and lifestyle decisions, including decisions about medical treatment, you would need the enduring guardian form. Great. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, just to let people know that the email that will come after the webinar has some links to some online dictionaries, legal dictionaries. So if some of the terms that Bridget's covered, um, you want some more information or want to follow that up, then you can look at those. So Yolanda, do you want to start by telling us about your role as an immigration lawyer? Sure, I can do that. Uh, so I am a lawyer in the immigration team and we do work mainly with uh, refugee and humanitarian type visas, mainly onshore protection visas and domestic violence victims who have visa issues as well as visa cancellation matters and we give advice about a broader range of things as well including things like travel exemptions uh, which are relevant at the moment with COVID and sponsoring family. Okay, thank you. All right, well, um, I'm bringing up this first slide which has a long list of words. Um, do you want to take us through those? Sure, okay. So there's a huge list here. Most of the definitions of these are pretty brief. Um, so visa might be obvious, but it's basically a, a, a document or a, a permission that gives you the right to travel to um, Australia, enter Australia or, or remain in Australia for a period of time, or sometimes permanently. So a visa application is the next one in that list and that's the process of actually asking uh, for a visa. So you ask the Australian government through an application process uh, and it will give you, yeah, that permission to travel to Australia, or enter or remain. An applicant is the person who's actually applying for the visa. And that's the same word we also use for citizenship applications. And I'll talk about citizenship in a couple of, well, on the next slide that pops up. Uh, sponsor or proposer is some visa applications require not just the person who wants the visa to make the application, but also another person to uh, support the application. So that other per person would need to be a citizen or permanent resident, depending on the kind of visa. Uh, and they might, it might also be an organisation, sometimes uh, a community organisation or uh, an employer, say. So another example, an example of a, a visa that requires a support person would be a partner or a family member is required to sponsor, um, say, somebody for a humanitarian visa. That's pretty relevant at the moment. Everybody's thinking about Afghanistan. So uh, that usually comes up with those visas. Uh, and then sometimes sponsorship comes with other responsibilities, particularly for things like partner visas, uh, such as financial support or providing somewhere for the person applying for the visa to live once they do arrive in Australia. And sometimes it involves paying for flights and other things um, involved with them transitioning to come into Australia. So lodgement of application, that's the that's what needs to happen. Basically it's a it's a legal it's a legal moment in time, if you like, it officially making an application for a visa is what's required with the Department of Home Affairs. Uh, it can't be done verbally. It's always a a process of applying online through the IMI account or using a paper application form, depending on the kind of visa that you're talking about. And then lodgement is the part where it's either submitted online or it's actually posted in, in some cases. Uh, they'll only accept certain visa applications by post. Onshore, uh, so if you're within Australia and you apply for your visa, that's called an onshore application. And then if you're not in Australia and you make an application for a visa while you're outside Australia, then that's called an offshore visa application. So whether you apply onshore or offshore also has an impact on 
often where you actually need to be located at the time the visa is granted. So that's why that also becomes important. So bridging visa, a bridging visa is a temporary kind of visa. It makes it lawful for a person to stay in Australia while they're waiting for something else to happen. So for example, someone who applies for a protection visa in Australia, they might be given a bridging visa so that they can wait in Australia while they're waiting for a decision about the outcome of their visa application. So it can also be given for other reasons, like if you're making arrangements to depart Australia or you have a court case that you need to be around for, or you have a medical issue that you need to address before leaving. There are a few, it's sort of limitless really what you can get a bridging visa for, um, but it's just a temporary kind of visa. It doesn't have a set time frame. It varies. It's, it's, quite, um, it's quite a variable thing depending on the situation. The character test. Uh, so for most visas, one of the requirements uh, is to be of good character. We'd probably say for all visas, that's actually a requirement. Uh, this is known, so this is the no, known as the character test. What the department will do is look at a person's criminal record usually to determine if they're of good character. There's a slightly different character test for citizenship applications though. Citizenship is different obviously to a visa, and we'll talk about that later as I said. Uh, so if a person has criminal convictions, it might mean they don't pass the character test. Uh, it might mean that there needs to be some more inquiry about whether or not they're of good character, depending on when the uh, offences were committed or when the convictions happened and what kind of offences they were. Police clearance. So this is an official document that's issued by uh, a nation's law enforcement body. Uh, and it lists any records they might have of a person uh, and their their history, which can, can include arrests, convictions, criminal proceedings, and things of that ilk. In Australia, when we do a police check, it's through the Australian Federal Police. Uh, so be, visa applicants who've been living in Australia for a while will need to get a police check prior to being granted a visa. And it will, in Australia, they only list what um, it only lists convictions rather than any of the other things that some overseas um, police checks might actually include, like arrests or other proceedings that are still happening. A visa grant is when a person successful in getting a visa to stay in Australia, either for a temporary period or a permanent or permanently, and that's when they're granted or given their visa. Depending on what kind of visa they applied for, um, yeah, it might be temporary or it might be permanent. Uh, and then, yeah, they have, they get an actual letter as well. It's called the visa grant letter, which they should really keep as a record because it helps them get access to certain things they'll then become eligible for. Okay. So next slide. <laughs> yeah, so here's some more immigration law words. Some more. Coming up. Yep. Okay. Let me just get my information up here. Sorry, I'm, I'm working with two screens here. It's a little bit tricky. Okay, so a visa refusal. So that's when a person um, is not successful with their application. It um, is when the Department um, of Home Affairs will make a decision not to approve the visa application. And sometimes, or a lot of the time, a person will get reasons for why they're refused. And with a couple of visas, that's not the case. They'll just get the refusal or they'll get a very generalised um, bit of information, but for others, they will get detailed reasons, which is relevant for the next word on that slide, which is merits review. Uh, so merits review is where if a person isn't happy with the decision they receive about their visa, whether it's refused or cancelled, and I'll talk about cancellation in a minute, um, they can often or usually ask for the decision to be changed. There are some exceptions to that. Not all visas get that opportunity to have a merits review, but um, in immigration law, most merits review will go to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. I believe you spoke about that earlier, one of the tribunals in civil law. Merits review, merits review is where the tribunal, and sometimes it is a departmental decision as well, it's, it can also go back to the department, say for visa cancellation matters, but merits review is where the tribunal makes the whole decision again, and they stand in the shoes of the original decision maker. The tribunal will look at the facts and evidence all over again and they'll come to their own decision about whether to affirm the decision the department made or to set aside that decision and make a different decision. 
in merits review, they can also take in new evidence and consider new facts. And again, there's there's like one or two exceptions to that, but in general, that's they can actually look at new material. And then judicial review, and so that, that decision from the department is relevant. So how the decision's made and the reasoning around that is, um, or what material they've looked at to come to their merits review decision is, is considered um, by the decision maker when they look at all the information again, but it's not the primary thing. But when you look at judicial review, the reasons for the, how a decision is made, either at the departmental level or at a lower court becomes much more important. So this is judicial review is where an applicant will ask a court to review how the decision was actually made and whether the decision maker applied the law correctly or made it what's called an error of law. So it's like a legal mistake. Um, it's it's uh, the decision maker can be the AAT in that case or a lower court, or um, it could be the minister themselves. It's a more technical kind of review. It's really hard for a person to succeed with a judicial review application without a legal representative. The um, judicial review is a process that allows the higher courts to supervise the tribunal and lower courts as well as the executive arm of government, so like the minister would be part of the executive, um, and protect um, the community against decisions by those bodies um, that might be outside of their authority, outside of the scope, what they're actually allowed to make decisions, how they're actually allowed to make decisions, um, or what they're allowed to make decisions about. So if the applicant is successful in having a decision set aside, either by a court or a tribunal, uh, then the application is remitted, so sent back to the department for them to action the new decision. Ministerial intervention. So the minister is a is a, po a politician who's basically in charge of a particular department of government. And at the moment, we have two in the immigration space. We have Karen Andrews, who's the Home Affairs Minister, and uh, we have Alex Hawke, who's the Minister for Immigration. Um, so the minister can intervene and change the decision, change a decision, um, either because a person asks them to in writing, or because they the minister chooses to. Um, the minister is not legally bound to intervene even if they're ask, asked, uh, so they'll only consider intervening if it's in the public interest and there's actually a list of things the minister won't actually intervene in. Depends on the minister, they change their mind, it's quite a political thing. So visa cancellation, that's um, something I've mentioned already a couple of times. So a visa can be cancelled for a few reasons. Most commonly it's because a person has been convicted of a criminal offence and that then they don't uh, they no longer meet the criteria for um, the character test, which I mentioned earlier. So another reason a visa can be cancelled is if the department believes a person provided false information or documents in order to have their visa granted in the first place. So they might get information later on and then say, hey, you know, we, we found this information out and we're going to cancel your visa. Or, and, and a person will have an opportunity to respond if they get a notice about their visa being cancelled unless they've received a a sentence of 12 months or more, in which case their visa will just be automatically cancelled and then they'll only have the opportunity to go into a merits review process. So yes, as I'd already mentioned that, so a person, a person, yeah, if they've got their visa cancelled, they can ask the department to give them their visa back. And if that doesn't, if the department doesn't agree, then it will go to a tribunal and eventually to, or a court, depending on who makes that decision. Freedom of information, uh, I, I don't know if this was mentioned earlier, I did listen in a little bit earlier and I think there was some reference to something similar, but there's a law in Australia called the Freedom of Information Act 1982 and that gives everyone the right to access copies of documents um, held by the Australian government about them um, and its agencies. So there are some documents that will be exempt, uh, you can make the request in writing and uh, it's another process where if you're refused, if they say, no, we're not going to give you the documents, you'll also have the right to have that decision reviewed. Um, citizenship, mentioned this as well. So the position or status of being a citizen of a particular country is what citizenship means. It, it can give you various rights and obligations that a person who isn't a citizen doesn't have. Sometimes it's obtained automatically, like if you're born in Australia to Australian citizen parents or permanent resident parents then you will become an Australian citizen. Uh, and sometimes it's obtained by application. If you've got a certain type of visa and you've been here for a certain amount of time, then you might become eligible to apply for citizenship. 
and that's called citizenship by conferral where you make the application because you've met some other criteria that doesn't relate to your birth. Naturalisation is the process of acquiring citizenship by application. So when you become a citizen, you are naturalised. Right, so that's all the immigration law words, I think. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yolanda, um, someone has asked a question, is citizenship and nationality interchangeable or different? Yeah, it means the same thing. If you're a nation of, if you're a national of Australia, you're an Australian citizen and vice versa, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's the only question I've had so far about your words. Um, you're welcome to stay on to the end, Yolanda, or if you need to go, that's fine because if people write questions about immigration law words, I can share them with you after the webinar because they're being recorded and you could follow them up or we can follow them up with you. So okay, that's I'm to happy you. to hang around. If, yeah, I'm happy to hang around and, and listen. Okay, in. good. Yeah, so yep. we're now going to um, get Bridget back online and talk about uh, words about debts. So Bridget, do you want to take us through this slide? Yes. Thanks, Yolanda. That was great. Um, so, sorry, I'm just getting to the right area uh, myself. So, uh, debts is part of uh, civil law and it, you might often hear the term consumer law used um, uh, because debts are one aspect of consumer law. Financial hardship is the first term that uh, you may, on this slide, that you may come across. So financial hardship is when a person can't pay money that they owe. And it's usually because of unexpected events or changes that have happened in their life. Um, so they may have lost their job or they may have had unexpected um, expenses for a health reason or for other reasons and so they can no longer meet their obligations to pay um, money that they owe. And if um, at Legal Aid, if we speak to somebody who is experiencing financial hardship, we can help them with any legal issues but we would refer them to a financial counsellor who I talked about earlier um, to give them help um, with the financial aspect of, of um, the problems that they're facing. Now, judgment. Um, this often comes up in uh, cases in court and tribunals that, um, uh, well, it's a, it's a decision of a court or a tribunal, um, but it comes up in uh, matters uh, involving debt and money. So it, a judgment is a decision of a court after it has heard the evidence in a matter. Um, and we've included default judgment because this comes up in um, money cases a lot. And a default judgment is when uh, there's a judgment um, in favour of the person who's brought the money claim because the um, person who owes them the money hasn't taken any steps to defend that claim. And as long as the um, plaintiff or the person who brings the money claim has satisfied the court with evidence, usually in documents, that the money is owed, then they can apply to the court to have a judgment entered in the absence of any evidence from the other party. And that is called a judgment by default or a default judgment. Judgment creditor and judgment debtor are terms that come up in uh, usually court matters involving money and debt. The judgment creditor is the person who is owed money and who gets a court decision in their favour. So once the court has made that decision, they become the judgment creditor. The judgment debtor um, is the other party. So once the court has made a decision, a judgment in favour of the person who brought the claim, the person who owes the money becomes the judgment debtor. Enforcement action. So once you have a judgment from a court about your money claim, you can take 
action to enforce the debt. And this um, is action that you take through the court to make somebody obey a notice or an order. An example is um, if you brought a money claim in a local court and um, you got a default judgment against the person that owes you money, you might ask the court to issue an examination order or a garnishee order or a writ for levy of property and I'm going to explain what those terms mean now. So an examination order is a court order that tells the person that owes you money that they have to answer questions about their finances um, and provide specific documents that you ask in relation to their finances. You would use an examination order to get information about whether the person actually has the ability to pay the debt that they owe you. A garnishee order is an, an order of a court or also of um, that can be made by the state uh, by Revenue New South Wales that tells a third party, so um, a bank for example, that they must pay money um, that belongs to the person who owes money and instead of leaving it in their bank account um, they have to pay that money either to the judgment creditor, the person who is owed money and who has a court decision in their favour or if it's Revenue New South Wales, then the bank has to pay money out of your bank account to Revenue New South Wales because you owe money for a fine. The last one, a writ for levy of property, is a court order that a sheriff's officer can take items belonging to a judgment debtor, the person that owes money, and the sheriff's officer can, um, the term used is seize or um, they usually place a label on all these items and if you don't um, arrange to pay the money that you owe then the sheriff's officer can return and take those um, items that belong to you away and sell them at an auction and then the money that they get at the auction is paid to the judgment creditor, the person who is owed money, towards satisfying the debt that is owed to them. I think okay. that's all of those. Kerry, are there any yes. questions about that slide? Yeah, there's a question there. Um, Bridget, can you explain the term robo-debt? Uh, robo-debt is a term that came up in, in particularly in relation to debts that were um, issued by Centrelink um, and they issued, uh, they had a program that um, I think reviewed um, uh, money that was paid to lots of people who received Centrelink um, income um, or Centrelink payments and um, their computer program, it was an automated process, um, uh, decided that all these people weren't entitled to the payment that they received after the program uh, reviewed their tax return that they filed at the end of the year. And so there was this automatic process of issuing um, debt notices to people. Um, and it, it's become well known because the, the way that that was done and the way that the program decided when people owed money had um, there were some problems with it and there were lots of appeals made so that's that's where the term robo debt is used mm. in specifically in that Centrelink space mm. okay so now we're going to bring up a no new slide which talks about fines some of the words on this slide I noticed you've you've already covered Bridget so I'll I'll skip over those but uh, a fine. So a fine is an amount of money that you have to pay to a government body, so that's Revenue New South Wales usually, if you have broken a law. So a fine can be given to you by a court, 
a police officer or another government agency such as your local council or a public trans transport body. So um, city rail, those sort of people that you can, you can get a fine um, from. And so a penalty notice is actually the fine. So a penalty notice is a fine issued by someone authorised by a government body which contains details about how you broke the law and how much money you have to pay. So what the fine is, is worth. So then the next word there is review. So when you get a penalty notice, you have the opportunity to ask for a review of that penalty notice. If you don't think that you uh, should have got that penalty notice due to the circumstances that were happening at the time, uh, so, and also things like uh, it may be a fine that was camera generated, a speeding fine, and it was against your car. It's registered to you, but you weren't the driver of that car. So you can submit a, a form online to Revenue New South Wales to nominate the other driver, which effectively is a review as well. Uh, so you can ask for a review while the, while the um, penalty notice is still at that stage. Once a penalty notice becomes overdue, so you get uh, 28 days to pay your fine, then you get another 21 days, uh, at, as a, sort of like a warning that your fine is due. After that period, your fine becomes overdue and then it becomes an enforcement order. And that's when, uh, when Revenue New South Wales can start to take uh, additional action to try and get you to pay their fine. And the other thing that happens that when a fine becomes an enforcement order is they start adding money to the fine. So they've got fees attached to enforcement orders as well. So your fine then becomes a fine plus an enforcement order fee amount and it can quickly become a bigger amount. One of the uh, enforcement actions that Revenue New South Wales can take is called a license suspension. So they can communicate with Transport for New South Wales or Roads and Maritime Services and have them suspend your license until you bring your fines under management. Now under management can include setting up a payment plan or um, paying the fine in full or doing uh, other things like a work and development order, which we'll get to. So a license suspension is a serious thing and driving while your license is suspended can also lead to more fines. So it's very important that people deal with their fines in, in the best way that they can and there's lots of options for that. So the other powers that uh, Revenue New South Wales have, if um, you still haven't paid your fine after they've suspended your licence, is the garnishee order, which Bridget spoke about, where they can take money out of your bank account or get your employer to pay money out of your wages to Revenue New South Wales um, to pay off your fines. And an order for examination, as Bridget explained, is where they can bring you to the local court to explain your income and expenditure and work out how to pay, out, pay your fines. But of course, there's lots of people in New South Wales who can't pay their fines for um, a whole range of reasons. And so we have this program called Work and Development Orders. That's the next words coming up on the slide. And so Work and Development Orders are for people who are eligible. There's a few, there's about six eligibility criteria. So people can be in financial hardship, they can be homeless. They can uh, have a mental health issue or medical issue or um, a drug and alcohol addiction. So they can do a work and development order with a sponsor organisation or a health practitioner. So they help people clear their fines depending on uh, how much the activity is, like what type of activity is, there's different amounts of money. For example, if you do some volunteer work under a work and development order, it's $30 an hour. If you do uh, a course at the TAFE, it's $50 an hour for each hour of study. Or if you're doing mental health treatment, it can be $1,000 a month. So you can pay a total of up to $1,000 a month off clear your fines uh, through a work and development order if you're eligible and with a sponsor. 
So the next word there is waiver. So if you ask for a review of your fine and Revenue New South Wales agree, then, uh, then they will waive the fine. So that means that you don't have to pay that fine anymore. So that's an option to Revenue New South Wales. And then the next term there is write off. So if you're suffering severe hardship, unable to pay your fine off instalments or complete a work and development order, you can also apply to have your fines debt written off by Revenue New South Wales. So that's another process. That means that it's cancelled and you don't have to pay any more um, money on that fine. Um, yeah, so the other thing to be aware of with waivers and write-offs is that if your fine also has demerit points attached to it uh, for for traffic fines, then you, the demerit points will still stand and there's a different process for dealing with demerit points. But if you have um, fines issues and demerit point issues, you can contact us for free legal help. And finally, we've got here public health order fines. We're finding quite a few people are calling us about those. So at the moment, um, under while we're going through the COVID-19 restrictions, the government has a number of what's called public health orders in place. And if people breach those orders, uh, then there are a number of fines that the police can issue. So you may have heard people talking about getting fines for not wearing a mask when outside or for gatherings which don't fit within the orders. There's a whole range of fines and they're called public health order fines. Those fines are being dealt with in, by Revenue New South Wales in exactly the same way as other fines uh, that are available in New South Wales and including people who are eligible being able to um, pay off their fines, public health order fines through a work and development order. Someone's just asked the question, can you be imprisoned if you can't pay your fine? That not in New South Wales. In New South Wales, we have all these other ways that you can pay off your fines, either through a payment plan or a work and development order, or we can assist with um, applying for waivers or a write-off. So you don't um, go to prison for fines dead in New South Wales. There, some um, offences do uh, could result in people being in court, uh, which might be, there might be a fine attached, but generally people won't go to court um, with a fine. People can choose to go to court to challenge their fine, uh, but that's something uh, that we ask people to get legal help before they, they make that choice. So I think that's everything about fines, Bridget. So we'll just get on to our last slide, which is about um, domestic and family violence. Thanks, Kerry. Oh, might be one minute, just bringing it up. Uh, so domestic and family violence is a common issue across all communities. At Legal Aid, we have a specialist domestic violence unit that assists people who have experienced uh, domestic and family violence. So just um, briefly, you might hear this topic spoken about as domestic violence or family violence or sometimes domestic and family violence. These terms mean the same thing, but um, different terms are used in different laws and have slightly different definitions in those laws. Um, okay, so the pin-op or the person in need of protection. When you um, uh, uh, might be interpreting um, in a court about um, apprehended domestic violence orders, which I'll explain shortly, you might hear this term being used and it stands for the person in need of protection. So the person who is the victim of domestic or family violence and who is asking the court to protect them by making an order that the, um, the person they say was violent to them um, cannot hurt them anymore and can't come near them. So they're the person protected by either an apprehended domestic violence order or an apprehended personal violence order, which I'll explain now. So um, there are two types of uh, violence orders in New South Wales. An 
uh, domestic violence order is a court order that's often applied for by the police on behalf of a person who is in need of protection. And it happens in a situation where that person is in a domestic relationship with someone who has caused them to be fearful because of physical or other abuse. Um, AVOs is, is a general term we use for these orders and they're civil orders, um, but if the person against whom the order is made doesn't obey the order, then breaching an AVO is a criminal offence. So they're a bit of an, um, a legal oddity in a way because they, an AVO is a civil order, but breach of it is a criminal matter. Um, an AVO um, is a document that has um, orders or conditions in it, and those conditions um, restrict the um, the violent person, often called the offender's behaviour. Examples of these conditions might be not to approach the protected person or to go within a certain distance of their home or their place of work. Sometimes um, parties to an AVO may still live together, but the order will contain, contain conditions that protect the person in need of protection, the pin-up from abuse. Um, an apprehended personal violence order is similar to a domestic violence order, but it applies to people who aren't in what's called a domestic relationship. So I should explain that a domestic relationship is where parties live together. They may be in um, a relationship such as husband and wife or uh, de facto, but um, they could also be flatmates living in the same house. So that is what comes under the term domestic um, relationship. Um, so an apprehended personal violence order apply is an order that you would apply for when the person who is um, causing you to hold fears or being violent towards you is not in a domestic relationship with you. So sometimes it, um, these um, orders are applied for by neighbours who are having a lot of uh, difficulty between each other. And if um, one person feels real fear because of the behaviour of their neighbour, they might ask the court uh, for an apprehended personal violence order. The next um, term is consent without admission. This um, happens when the person you say was violent to you agrees to the court making an apprehended violence order, but they don't admit any of the things that you say happened. So um, these orders might be made by a court after hearing evidence, but sometimes um, the parties, often with the help of support workers or um, solicitors, negotiate for the offender or the person who was violent or caused you fear to agree to an AVO being made by the court, but they don't admit um, to any of the things that you have said happened. Now there's different terms um, in the process of um, an AVO being made that you might hear, and these are provisional, interim and final orders. So a provisional apprehended violence order is an order that's applied for by a police officer and granted either by a court or a senior police officer. They, uh, police will apply for a provisional AVO when they believe that someone needs protection immediately. Sometimes these are called um, telephone interim orders uh, as they can be applied for by phone, fax or online. These um, provisional orders contain um, certain conditions and some additional ones that might be added um, and it's to protect the person in an urgent situation and it lasts until the court makes an interim or final AVO 
or until it's revoked. So an interim AVO is an order made by the court which either extends the provisional AVO or where the court agrees that it is necessary um, for someone to have temporary protection. You may not have a provisional AVO but you might apply to court and the court agrees to grant an interim AVO until it hears evidence about whether a final AVO should be made. Often when a serious violence offence has been committed, the court has to make an interim AVO to protect the person who was the victim of the violence. A final AVO is made by the court to protect a person from the other party and they can make, a court can make a final apprehended violence order in different circumstances, including if the offender doesn't come to court, if they agree to a final AVO being made or if the court agrees with you after hearing evidence from you and perhaps other witnesses that um, an AVO should be made for your protection. A final AVO is for a set period of time. The court can set the time but if it doesn't it will be for 12 months. Um, it, there's an automatic 12 months. Now breach is what I spoke about earlier. It's when um, a person, the person who was violent uh, doesn't obey what the conditions that are in the AVO and so they um, do what is called breach the AVO. And as I said earlier, breaching an AVO is actually a criminal offence and um, if the breach is reported to the police, the person can be charged with um, the offence of breaching AVO. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Bridget. Um, someone asked a question, can you please clarify the difference between family and domestic violence orders? Uh, well, there isn't necessarily a difference. Um, sometimes uh, there might be orders made in the setting of um, a family, but um, if you're in a, um, in a family, then the relationship that you have is what's called a domestic relationship. So I think that these terms are fairly interchangeable. Yes. And someone's asked, why are some APVO cases referred for mediation? My understanding is mediation is not legally binding. Well, I guess it depends on what the outcome of the mediation is. But um, the example that I gave where apprehended personal violence orders are often applied for can often um, arise in neighbourhood disputes between two neighbours and mediation is usually more successful in helping those neighbours resolve whatever the underlying issues are between them and it means that um, they might have a better relationship between each other moving forward. There may be mediation and um, the person who has been violent or, violent or threatening towards the other neighbour might agree to an AVO being made. Um, a mediator can't make that order but it might be an outcome of the mediation that there is an agreement um, that an APVO will be granted and then the parties would go back before the court for the court to make that order um, in accordance with what the parties have agreed to. So uh, I think it's a recognition that um, in circumstances where the parties aren't in a domestic relationship, there may have been a history of things happening that can sometimes be resolved when an indep independent person helps the parties see each other's perspective. Um, so in that case, perhaps they start out applying for an apprehended personal violence order, but through the help of a mediator, they're able to resolve the underlying issues and then agree that perhaps they don't need that protection. 
Okay, thanks Bridget. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, we've, we've come to the end of our content for the webinar. If anyone has any questions uh, that they want to put to Bridget or Yolanda, they can type them in now. We've, we've got a few minutes to, to look at those. I'll just quickly show you this slide that's coming up which is Legal Words for Interpreters webinars coming up. So next Friday, we have a Criminal Law Words webinar on the 3rd of September from 9.30 to 12.30 p.m. Uh, then in October, we've got two webinars in the same week, one on mental health and tenancy or housing law words uh, on Tuesday, the 12th of October from 10 to 12, and one on uh, family law words on Thursday, the 14th of October from 10 to 12. So you can find details about those webinars in the newsletter or uh, the um, on our website, on our page, workshops and webinars on the Legal Aid New South Wales website. So um, we've come to the end where we say thank you and to both Bridget and Yolanda and we answer your questions. Uh, following this webinar, there will be a, uh, a an email that comes out. Now that email has links to online dictionaries and other resources to help you understand civil law words. It'll also have a link in there where you can download your certificate, which is where you get your CPD points for NATI from, showing them that certificate. So I'll just have a, a quick look at some questions. Someone did have a question there, Bridget. Um, earlier on, someone was asking whether we can talk about defamation it's not something we were going to cover. I don't know if you have in your mind a quick definition of the word defamation. <laughs> <laughs> so so defini defamation, and now this is me without being able to do research, but defamation is when somebody makes statements publicly about another person that um, would lead other people to... Um, well, that would reduce their public reputation. And you most often hear about defamation cases uh, in the media that involve more well-known public figures or um, I guess famous people because their reputation is often what um, is important to their livelihood. So they may bring a case against um, a media organisation if they think that something that's been printed or said defames them or uh, brings their reputation into what's called disrepute or um, I guess reduces their reputation in the public in the public's eye um, and they're the sorts of cases that are more successful when the person's and more relevant when the person's livelihood or career um, is intertwined with their reputation. Thank That's you. That's my off the cuff um, answer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, someone's asked about when we were just talking about family violence, domestic violence, if someone is experiencing financial abuse, can the abuser be prosecuted or given an uh, ADVO? Well, I think more and more that um, financial control and financial abuse is a recognised form of domestic violence. So I think that, yes, a person could apply for an apprehended domestic violence order. It may not be a situation where the police would necessarily um, become involved where if it's, if it's only in relation to financial abuse or control, but... Um, it is definitely recognised as being part of what's called domestic or family violence. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, just looking back at some previous uh, questions, someone asked, was criminal negligence criminal law? Uh, yes, my answer to that would be yes. Um, probably good to ask a criminal lawyer that question as well, but um, the the term negligence that I was talking about and trying to give you a definition of is um, what is used in the civil law area, but sometimes um, you can be charged with um, what is criminal negligence, and it might be 
Um, sometimes driving offences might be criminal negligence. Um, that's the only example that springs to mind. Mm -hmm. And notice of motion, can you just explain that again for someone who needed oh, that? So a, a notice of motion is, is a um, court document that a party to a civil case would file when they're asking the court to make particular orders. Um, so you file a document called a notice of motion and you explain your reasons for asking the court to make a particular order in an affidavit that you have to file along with the notice of motion. So you swear an affidavit setting out the reasons you're asking the court to do a particular thing. An example might be where a case is um, progressing through the court's case management um, system um, and you may have been given a hearing date that's coming up in a month, but something unexpected has happened and you can't um, attend the hearing date, um, then a, a, you or a solicitor acting on your behalf might ask the court to um, vacate the hearing date or change the hearing date. And a way to ask the court to do that, to bring your case back before the court sooner, is to file a notice of motion. Mm. Okay, and someone, a couple of people have asked about, you talked about burden of proof, but they've also asked about this term evidentiary burden. So evidentiary burden is, is really um, another term for the burden of proof. So in a particular case, the person who, who brings the case in, in, in a civil law context, they bear the evidentiary burden of proving their case um, and satisfying the decision maker that their case, what they say happened or should happen, is more likely than not. So that it's more probable than not on the balance of probabilities the decision maker should find in their favour. Sometimes in a case the other party might have an evidentiary burden but it depends on it it depends on the particular context. Um, sometimes the evidentiary burden might move between the parties for particular parts of a case. But what it means is that if, if a party says something or in a court case context, that they have the burden of bringing evidence to prove what they're saying. So sometimes it can move between the parties, but whoever has the evidentiary burden has to bring evidence, witnesses or, or court or documents um, to prove what they're saying is true. Okay, thanks. And someone was asking about the difference between a respondent and a defendant. So the, the difference is, is the type of case um, that is in the court, but basically they are the person that is having to answer a particular case. So a case is brought against them. Generally, um, civil cases tend to be applicant and respondent. Um, but the example that I gave earlier was about where sometimes counsel um, bring claims in court against people and the council representative is the prosecutor and the person um, who has to, who has a case brought against them is called the defendant in that instance. And that is a civil law context. Okay, and one last question. Uh, some of the questions will follow up after the webinar, but this last one is, could you please explain when would a document called statement of claim be used? So a statement of claim is used um, most often in civil cases where the person who wants to start a case files, um, has to file that document in order to start their case before the court. So a statement of claim is the first document in civil cases that a person will file in a court to start their case. And 
a statement of claim is the document where the person sets out in a fairly formal legal way what their claim is against the other person. It's not used in every um, civil law situation, but um, generally to bring a claim before a court, you would use a statement of claim document. All right. Well, I think we might end it there. We've gone a little bit over time. So um, we will uh, end our webinar now and I'll uh, thank you very much, Bridget, and also Yolanda for your time today in helping us understand all these civil law words used in courts and tribunals and when lawyers are giving advice to their clients about civil law matters over the phone or in person. Um, just a reminder that there'll be a feedback survey link coming after the webinar and we really appreciate your feedback and an email with links to all the information we've talked about today including a link to be able to download your certificate. If you're watching this webinar as a recording, you can send an email to cle at legalaid.newsouthwales.gov.au and we can organise that certificate. Okay, so, and also remember if you or your family or friends have a legal problem, you can refer them to Law Access New South Wales on 1300 888 529 for free legal information and referral, including referral to Legal Aid New South Wales. And we look forward to welcoming you all to our next Law for Community Workers webinar, including our ones coming up for Legal Words for Interpreters. So thanks again for your time today and your participation, and um, we'll see you next time. So bye, Bridget. Thanks, Kerry and Yolanda. I'll just say, Kerry, I would really appreciate feedback um, because we are happy to include words that you might um, have thought we would um, and to we're happy to um, receive that feedback and to change what we do um, so that we meet your needs. Yes, definitely. So each after each webinar, we review the content and we add words. Um, so yeah, for our next civil law webinar for for interpreters, we'll have some new words, I'm sure, based on our feedback today. So see you later, everyone. Bye, Bridget. Bye, Thanks, Yolanda. everyone. Bye, Yolanda and Kerry. Bye.